Alex here with a legal nuts and bolts video on mediation and settlement. If you are representing yourself, this is probably the second most important video for you to watch. The first most important being the video titled Representing Yourself. This is a replacement video. I have uh, actually I've only done this once before, but I do plan to continue doing replacement videos. The reason why is because there's updates in the law. I want to reorganize my thoughts. I want to mention that one of the things I'm going to do with the new videos is I'm going to avoid mentioning specific statutes in case law because that stuff can change and it could actually cause more harm than good. Consistent with this channel is the importance that each of you, you know, do your own research for your own state because that's the best way to keep these videos relevant 5, 10, 15 years later is to not cite specific statutes, rules, and case law, which can change in 5, 10, or 15 years. This video is going to replace the following videos. Uh, mediation and settlement, uh, mandatory mediation orders, settlement negotiations not admissible, stipulations, and then there's another one called stipulations and joint petitions, sabotaging settlement, and uh, offers of judgment. Each of those videos is going to be moved to members only. It's going to be pulled out of the playlist. This video will be added to the Legal Nuts and Bolts playlist, but I do want to say that as with most of the videos on my channel, I draw on my experiences in my child custody dispute most. So even though this is not going to go into the high conflict child custody category, it's still going to be extraordinarily relevant for those particular people. And as I mentioned earlier in this video, if you're representing yourself, it's especially important for you to watch this. I want to mention that it's important to understand the difference between mediation and settlement. When I imagine settlement, at least in Nevada, I'm talking about a settlement conference. And I guess you could say emails back and forth with your opponent's attorney or your opponent if they don't have one. Um, settlement conferences, from what I have seen in Nevada, are held in a courtroom and there is a judge on the bench, a settlement judge. Sometimes they get a different judge, which I think is a great idea. Other times they actually use your judge, which sometimes isn't such a great idea. In fact, there are some lawyers who think it's uh, um, coercive for your own judge to be presiding over your settlement conference because there are some issues, especially in child custody cases, where the judge really will push hard for settlement to the point of even borderline violating the judicial canons. There is actually a judicial canon that says they shouldn't coerce settlement. And... Um, in those situations, it's it can become really, I guess they call it undue pressure because there's this idea that if you don't settle, then the judge is going to punish you when it goes to litigation. So I do want to at least talk about that a little bit, that yes, um, that is a concern. Even some lawyers have pointed it out. And um, I guess, you know, that's sort of the definition that I have um, uh, for settlement. Mediation, I kind of picture no judge, no attorneys involved might be different in other states, um, but I do imagine just sort of not even in the courtroom, just uh, maybe there's a center, like a mediation center that your courthouse has where you meet. Maybe there is some kind of third party office that does it. Maybe it's just done in, a, in somebody's law office. Uh, the point I'm trying to make with mediation is that there is no judge and it's just a mediator. My understanding is that mediators don't have any power um, with the exception of if you come to an agreement. If you come to an agreement, then they draft the agreement, send it to the court for approval. Um, you need to do your own research, though, because different states have different rules. And I've even seen in Nevada that mediators, not um, the child custody ones, just in other sorts of areas of law, that they have the power to give the courts something called a bad faith notice. And so you need to look into that. Um, number one, does your mediator have any power at all to enter any kind of order against you? Number two, um, does your mediator have the power to tell the court that you're mediating in bad faith? These things matter. You have to learn the boundaries of what the mediator can do so that you understand sort of what your approach is going to be going in there. Don't just wing it. Um, so with bad faith notices, my understanding is that the mediator can let the judge know that they are of the opinion that you aren't mediating in bad faith. I really hope that there is some kind of definition to what that is. Because I really hope that it's just not the mediator's opinion that, oh, well, I thought that was a fair deal and he didn't take it, so I'm going to mark that as bad faith. I mean, there are some things to me that are obvious bad faith, like you don't even show up. Like if you don't even show up to your mediation, that's messed up. Um, maybe 
refusing to talk or just, I don't know. There, I really hope that there's some kind of parameter as to what bad faith is, just so that you don't end up going in with the same problem that I mentioned with the settlement judge, which is that if you don't do what they want, settle the case, and they're going to you, you know use that against you and basically try and hamstring you going forward if you have to litigate. So definitely determine whether or not you're going to a mediation or a settlement because they're different. And then, of course, what the, the power of the mediator is. And then, of course, if you're going to a settlement, whether it's going to be your own judge or a different judge. Uh, typically, at least in Nevada, as I mentioned earlier, attorneys do not participate in mediation, but they do participate in settlement. Um, in other states, they may be different. So you, the, the thing that I really want to stress here is that you do your research and learn what the limits and powers of the particular scenario that you're going into is. Um, the role of mediation and settlement is different from litigation. Um, I think with my case, it was abundantly clear to me that my ex just treated mediation as an extension of the litigation process. And so she would just continue to attack my character, accuse me of things. It was just like, to her, it was just another courtroom. And so she didn't really switch from the attack and get what I want phase to the let's see if we can come into an agreement phase. And so it's important that you understand that if, um, especially if you know your mediator doesn't really have any power to do to enter any orders anyway. If your mediator only has the power to enter an agreement, then it's especially important that you kind of, you just drop that mindset because, you know, you're not trying to prove anything to them because they're not there to accept proof. That's another thing that's uh, very confusing for non-attorneys and especially a high conflict ex that's for the most part obsessed with conflict attacking you uh, is that they think that or if you're just not a regular non-attorney you just think that this is just another person who's hearing you know the proof that you have and you just kind of get stuck in hold on let me prove to you why i should get what i want and it's like they're not there to weigh the different proofs and stuff like that i mean they may ask because they may feel like okay you have a strong case or a weak case so you should probably think about settling in that sort of sense they might care about that information but other than that it's not like they're going to sit there and say hey such and such has proven to me that you're a bad parent, so you need to take the seal. I think a lot of people go in there thinking that that's kind of what's going to happen, when really it's just not. It's just not, they don't have that kind of power. Um, and they can't enter findings, and they can't communicate to the court, you know what, this person's believable to me. I think this person's lying. This person has great evidence. A lot of people don't know that that's not something that the mediator can do, and so they, they get stuck in that phase. So you have to learn the difference between litigating and trying to settle a case. It's very different. And you're just going to end up wasting your time if you go in there stuck mm -hmm. in the same mindset that you have when you just go into the courtroom to litigate. Another thing that I want to talk about is the sliding scale of settling. A lot of people think that, okay, since I'm going to settle, I'm expecting half, you know, 50-50. I get half of what I want. This could apply to child custody as much as it can apply to money cases. But that's not how it works. And it really, I think, frustrates a lot of people that they're getting a settlement offer that is way less than 50-50. Uh, and they can get emotional about it. And attorneys understand this. Stronger cases get better settlement offers. Weaker cases get weaker settlement offers. It's just how it is. If one side has a very high likelihood of success, they may be willing to settle, but they're going to want more than half. If one side has a very weak case, they also may be willing to settle because they don't want to go into court and get their ass handed to them. But they also may understand, you know what, I'm not going to get 50-50. My case is weak. So they'll offer a weaker settlement. I think that's one of the reasons why so many cases settle. A lot of people think that's some kind of a front to the legal system that very few cases go to trial. A lot of times it's just that both of the attorneys are competent attorneys. They understand the law. They can predict the outcome to a, a certain degree. And if both of the attorneys are, you know, competent enough to understand the likelihood of success and they're very close to that same, you know, sort of percentage, then they're very likely going to realize this is what the offer needs to be. One side may say, you know what, this could go either way. And the other side will say, yeah, I agree, this could go either way. So let's split it 50-50. Um, in another case, one side can say, you know, I'm going to win this case unless, you know, one of these rare things occurs. And the other side may say, you're right, you do have a strong case. So why don't we give you 
Um, when you end up going to trial is when one side thinks I have a strong case and the other side thinks, no, I have a strong case. And then there's this disconnect. And so there's no there's no settlement between those sides because both sides think they have a strong case when really they don't. Um, when a non-attorney is involved, that's extremely likely to happen because non-attorneys don't know how to predict legal outcomes. And that's why a lot of times people get frustrated because they're like, my lawyer sucks. They're telling me I should only get a quarter of what I'm asking for. If we're going to settle, I should get half. And they don't understand that there's just there's a dynamic to this. So, yeah, I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, if you don't have an attorney, that's another problem in the sense that the other side knows that you don't know anything about the law and they may try to psych you out. This is what happened in my case, is my ex's attorney exploited the fact that it didn't have an attorney and she tried to make it seem like what I was asking for was never going to happen. Luckily, I didn't fall for it and I went to litigation and I ended up getting what I wanted. But I can see now, based on that experience, how um, certain attorneys who just, they know that you don't have a lawyer and they will try to trick you. It's, I can't say that that doesn't happen. I just cannot in good conscience say. And that makes it hard for people, I think, because now they don't know. Is my ex's attorney lying to me? Are they trying to trick me? When you don't have any experience, rep you know, representing yourself or in the legal system at all, you're just not going to have a clue. And so the more you can learn about the process, the more you can learn from YouTube, the more you can learn about the statutes, rules, and case law, the better. It's still not going to even come close to having experience, but at least you'll have some kind of idea. Just don't go into court blind and learn as much as you can before the process. Don't just kind of think to yourself, there's nothing I can do. I'm just going to wing it. Spend some time doing some research so that you can mitigate the possibility that your ex's attorney will try and psych you out. That's what I did. I ended up learning about joint physical custody, about uh, the Rivero 2009 decision. I ended up talking to um, an attorney, I went to a console, and that sort of bolstered my confidence. So don't just go with your gut. Do more than that, please, and learn a little bit about the process. And keep in mind, your ex's lawyer is not your friend. Your ex's lawyer is your ex's lawyer. If your ex, if your ex asks for crazy things, a lot of people will think, that, well, that's, that's horrible that my ex's lawyer isn't stopping her or that my ex's lawyer isn't taking my side. It's not your ex's lawyer's job to take your side under any circumstances. They were hired to take their client's side. And when it comes to best interests of the child, whatever your ex says those best interests are, the lawyer is for the most part going to argue it. I'm sure behind closed doors, the lawyer may tell the client something like, hey, this isn't a good idea. This isn't good for your child. Um, but when push comes to shove, if they dig their heels in, the lawyer only really has two choices. Just try and psych you out and argue for the thing that's harmful for the child or, um, dump the client, which is the thing that I don't think occurs very often. I think usually they will try and advise your ex. You probably shouldn't argue for this. The judge might get upset with us. Most of the time, I think if they dig their heels in, they're just going to go to court and give it a shot. And so you just have to get over this idea that you're mad at your ex's lawyer because that's just, they're just doing their job. If, if anyone, if you need to get mad at anyone for something harmful happening to your child, it should be the judge because they're the one that's in control. I mean, if your ex asks for something that's nutty, the judge should be the one to say, nope, not going to happen. So that's one of the things that I talk about in the video targeting the lawyer is, you know, as much as you hate your ex's lawyer, you shouldn't be getting orders that are favoring your ex's lawyer just because they have a lawyer that's really to blame. That's really something that's the judge's fault, not your ex's lawyer. And that's just something that goes to the culture of the family court system. It's one of those things that you really need to dig into. Then you're going to want to watch the video targeting the lawyer. Um, settle for what's best for your child. A lot of times people will settle for things because they think that they're going to curry favor with their ex. They think that they're going to curry favor with their ex's lawyer. They think that they're going to make the judge happy. The judge does not remember you. Watch the video. The judge does not remember you. If you think that you're going to make your judge happy because you took a deal, the next time you end up in court, the judge isn't even going to know who you are. They're not even going to remember any of that. So if you're going to settle for something, Stick to what I just said, settle for something that's best for the child. I mean, certain things there's wiggle room on, especially money when it comes to like child support, 
uh, when it comes to division of assets and debts, when it comes to maybe dates and times of the timeshare schedule or holidays, that kind of stuff. I mean, but when it comes to crazy things, like I settled to midnight exchanges, I probably shouldn't have done that. And the reason I did that was because my ex was going to offer me so many things that I wanted. So my ex was going to give me the joint physical custody. And I was just like, you know what? I want this thing so desperately that I'll say yes to the midnight exchanges. And I ended up having to deal with that for so many years. Our son ended up having to be woken up at midnight from ages like two to eight-ish. I don't know. It's just, It was just nuts, guys. Um, judges do push hard for settlement, especially in family court. If that is something that you're dealing with, I totally sympathize. I, I had to deal with it too. It is scary. But the, the only thing that I can say is you just have to, to fight through it. If it's something that is particularly egregious, hopefully the judge will come around to it later when you litigate the issue. I had uh, three opportunities at mediation uh, to settle with my ex. I refused all three times and all three times I went to litigation and won. All three times I was scared though. I was afraid that I was going to be punished and it came close a couple of times. I'm not going to talk about the details of these three times because I've published on my docket series. If you want to go into the details, watch on my docket series on high conflict child custody and you will see each and every one of those three examples of the sort of internal conflict in my mind and and just kind of just going, just saying, no, I'm not going to take this deal, going to litigation and luckily winning in the end, please. It's it's tough. I know it is terrifying, but sometimes you, sometimes the offer is so obviously harmful to your child or makes no sense and you just have to fight through it. Um, please watch the My Docket series because then you can actually see the examples of what I had to go through and, and hopefully it helps you guys understand where that line is, where where you just, you know, take the deal and walk away and where you just, you have to go to court. Um, it's one of the most torturous um, experiences is, is, is the fear of the courtroom with, you know, against the, the knowledge that this settlement offer is just not even close to what's reasonable. And it's it's one of the things that a lot of people struggle with when it comes to high conflict child custody. Um, I do want to mention that there are some court rules, at least in Nevada, that let you argue your way out of mediation. And I, <laughs> I did this as soon as I learned about those rules. After the third time of mediating, I was like, I'm done mediating. My ex never used the process in good faith to her. It was just another way to nitpick, to attack me. It sucked every single time. Um, in the county that I was, there were quite a few ways to get out of mediation. One of them was if you could show your ex had abused or neglected the child, which mine did, Another, and I could show. Another one is um, if your ex has a personality disorder. And then another one is if you're just in the post-judgment phase and you're just back in you know court so many times. I don't know if all other... Um, states have something similar. I know that even the other counties in Nevada don't have that kind of mechanism. Um, but yes, you can get out of mediation. And I did use that in my case after the third time. And luckily the judge sided with me. I mean, I even had an attorney friend of mine who was representing me for free. Um, and she told me, hey, Alex, judge is not going to like that you're trying to get out of mediation. And then I was like, you know what, let me just talk to the judge when we go into court. And that that happened. Um, I went into court. I explained it to the judge and she agreed with she agreed with me. Uh, judge Bridget Robb um, agreed that I shouldn't have to go back to mediation based on the provisions of the court rule. Um, so yeah, definitely do your research. Find out if that's something that you can do because if you're dealing with a high conflict ex, it's just going to be a waste of your time and possibly money because sometimes they charge. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is settlement agreements are not appealable. If you agree, you cannot appeal it. There are some ways to argue that you were under duress when you made the agreement, but you can't appeal that directly. I have seen some attorneys file uh, what they call a Rule 60 motion. Um, it's a motion that they can use to try and set aside an order. And then in that motion, I've seen them argue duress and things like that. 
And then if that is denied, you can try to appeal that. But then, of course, the court is going to be looking at your allegations about why that particular deal was, ex you know, I don't want to say extorted. Um, I guess, you know, exacted under duress. Um, so, I mean, the appeal is different. It's not really so much that you don't like the deal or that you feel it's unfair. It's that you're trying to attack the circumstances under which it was entered into. So, and then I have seen uh, sometimes a court will enter into a, uh, a court will approve a settlement that is in some way in violation of law. And I think I've seen attorneys try and use the Rule 60 motion or maybe even a motion for reconsideration. And, and then if that is denied, then you could possibly appeal that. But the settlement in and of itself is not appeal uh, is not appealable. Something else that you try to attack it with later, some other motion, you might possibly be able to find a way to appeal. But the actual uh, settlement itself, you're going to be stuck with. Um, Mandatory mediation orders. What these are is a court order that says that you are required to mediate before you ask for some kind of relief. You need to do some research in your state to see if these are legal. Um, in Nevada, we had a case published, and again, I'm not going to mention the case because it could change. Um, you have to do your own research and find it. Um, there is a case that published in Nevada that said that an order entered by a judge that required two mediation attempts was unconstitutional. It violated the uh, constitutional right to petition the courts for redress, and then that it uh, violated the courts, the judge's obligation to sit and preside over cases. So um, there are ways that a court can order mediation, um, you know, based on having reviewed the, the the briefs, but this particular order, the Supreme Court of Nevada was not happy with because um, they felt that there may be some instances where mediation is impossible or where the best interests of the child require the court to do something immediately. And so that was the concern that the court had. I mean, it seemed to me from what I read in the opinion that they were okay with the court reading the briefs and saying, you know what, I've read the motion opposition reply, and I think you guys should mediate on this first. That's so. It seems like that's okay with them. And there are some rules that just arbitrarily say that you have to mediate once, you know, just when you open up the case. It just seems that they have any problem with that. It seems that they only had a problem with an order that restricted a parent from filing some kind of motion until they had mediated first. It seemed like they keyed in on the court saying, you can't even file something until you do this, this, and this. That was, I, you know, my impression of the precedent in, in Nevada that published was that they didn't like that the court tried to bar access to the courtroom with that particular mandatory mediation order. So, yeah, if you guys have a mandatory mediation order that says something like that, that you just can't even file anything, um, that may be something that you can challenge as unconstitutional, but you'll want to do some research, of course. I want to talk a little bit about confidentiality of settlement and mediation. The concern that I have seen by the Supreme Court here is that they really want people to feel safe when they go and mediate and or settle. And they don't want to allow people to use their own offers against them as a weapon later on in the litigation process because then they're afraid that if they allow that to occur that it'll have some kind of chilling effect on people's desire to mediate or settle their case in good faith they're afraid that hey this particular case somebody said something in mediation that the other side used against them in litigation to win litigation and so now ever since this happened Nobody wants to really communicate in good faith anymore because they're afraid that whatever they say could be used against them later on. So for the most part, from what I have seen, you have to do your own research because there is precedent on this, at least in Nevada there is for sure. Um, you can't, you seem to be very safe as to what you say in mediation and settlement. Um, it does seem to me that it does apply to letters and emails that have been communicated back and forth as well. But those are kind of iffy because I have still seen some of that stuff pop up as an exhibit. And I don't know to what extent a judge will disregard those types of communications. So you should probably do some research on, you know, to what extent you can block 
your communications being used against you in the litigation process when you're just trying to settle the case in good faith. Uh, definitely, it's something that I would look into, though, because it is something that is relevant. My ex's attorney did try to use my communications against me in litigation. Basically, we had mediated or tried to settle, and um, she brought up later on when it went to litigation, she's like, hey, you should just do this because this is what Alex offered. Um, and so since, I mean, she saw that her client was going to just lose everything. And she was like, oh, my God. I'm going to get nothing. Um, hold on a second. Wait a minute. Look, Alex sent this email saying that he was willing to offer this. So maybe you can just order this. I mean, and luckily the, <laughs> the judge just kind of stared at her when she did that because that wasn't proper. Um, again, guys, that's in the My Docket series. You can actually see that hearing. Uh, I'm going to move on, though, to the next topic. Okay, this is very technical, but I want to talk about it anyway. Settling in general, and even settling during the middle of a hearing slash trial. I've seen this happen before. You have to understand that if you settle, whether it's before the case, before any kind of hearing or trial, or during or in the middle of the hearing or trial, there is something called collateral estoppel. It's also called issue preclusion. It's one of the two species of res judicata that will not take effect. And so... If you end up coming back to court later on and you expect to be able to rely upon the evidence, which would include witnesses, that you intended to call or even did call, and there's a, a specific example where an individual had a um, an expert, he even paid for the expert. The expert did this huge report and then appeared on the stand and testified in his favor. He was the father. And the expert was testifying how the court should do joint physical custody if they could make it work. But if not, that the court should award custody to the father because of these extreme mental health concerns that he had with regards to the mother. And he settled halfway through the case. And he probably didn't know this, but by doing that, the court never um, litigate. The issue was not considered litigated when you do that. And so one of the requirements for issue preclusion slash collateral estoppel, there's, it's synonymous terms. One of the requirements for, for that to take hold and for you to lock those findings in is that the case was actually necessarily litigated. And so later on, the mother filed a motion um, to get primary physical custody and basically validate her move to another state. And she ended up winning. And the, the biggest weakness that I think the father had was that none of that evidence got in before and there was no um, findings in his favor. And when, when the new um, evidentiary hearing occurred, there was no witness on the stand and the judge didn't have any of that testimony to rely upon. And all that the court had was, had, the court had different evidence. And a lot of the evidence that the mother used was also used at the prior trial. However, the expert had testified as to why even considering that evidence he still thought the father should have custody. Well, at the new trial, the expert wasn't on the stand. And so the judge ruled in favor of the mother and she ended up getting everything she wanted. And this was a huge shocker for this particular father. But I'm not trying to scare people from <laughs> settling before the case or settling um, in the middle of a trial. I just try to, to let people know that there are some technical legal principles that will not take hold if you do that. And you should understand that. Probably what the father could have done later on was just made sure to call that expert back into the evidentiary hearing, and, and maybe that would have made everything okay. Um, and maybe that's something for you guys to think about, too. I mean, if you're going to settle your case, just keep in mind that later on, if you have to go to court and you expect to rely on that evidence, you're going to have to still gather all that stuff up. I mean, the, without issue preclusion and findings of fact taking hold, none of that stuff has been proven. So to you... It feels like, okay, well, this deal was based upon all of this evidence that I had. Okay, that makes sense. But the court doesn't see it that way. If you're going to come back to court and have an evidentiary hearing or a trial, and all you have going back is a bunch of settlements, that's not really evidence that the court has taken, considered, and entered findings on. There is something called stipulated findings. I've heard of this before. But from my experiences, it doesn't occur very often. 
And if you do expect to have stipulated findings, you have to specifically ask for them. And the other side has to specifically agree to them. And that actually could cause a settlement to fall through. The other side might be willing to settle. And then when you ask, hey, hold on a second, I want you to stipulate to the following five things. And they might say, heck no, no, I'm not going to do that, which will force you to go to court. So these are just things to, st to think about. If you're going to stipulate to findings and then um, the effect that, that you know, skipping the trial has, you know, there may be concerns that, that um, you, the witnesses that you have may forget or maybe you've paid twelve, thirteen thousand dollars for a report, and you might think, you know what, I can't afford to do this again in a few years. So, these are things that you have to think about. You should probably watch my video on the topic issue preclusion to learn about how that works exactly. If you want to know why this is something that you should consider, um, some attorneys will say that this doesn't really matter so much because of the change of circumstances requirement. Maybe. I mean, you're going to want to watch the video change of circumstances to learn how that works. It doesn't apply in every single situation. It it applies in Nevada when, at least right now, it could change when a, when a parent has primary physical custody. If they don't, then it doesn't apply. And it's only it only applies because of a statute. So they could always change the statute, take the statute away. Other states might not even have the statute. So uh, kind of, I mean... The thing that sucks about change of circumstances is it's a barrier only, only in the sense that nothing new has occurred in the case. If something new has occurred in the case, they can get around it, trigger a trial slash evidentiary hearing, and then you still have the problem of all of the previous allegations now being relevant. This is another tricky thing about change of circumstances. I'm not going to talk a lot about it because I have a video dedicated to it. So I'm going to stop and you should really watch the video change of circumstances and get a full understanding uh, before you think that that is going to be um, your sort of safety barrier. By the way, in that last case that I was mentioning, um, that did come up and the judge basically ruled that change of circumstances didn't trigger because the order um, on primary physical custody didn't trigger. The, ba the judge basically said that, well, since the mom filed a motion before a primary physical custody triggered, then change of circumstances doesn't apply. So the judge ended up getting around that anyway in that particular case. Really, I feel like that is a case where highly technical legal principles interfered with a father's ordinary understanding of fairness. Um, I think that the father thought, you know, this is what happened at the previous hearing. The judge is going to remember all this stuff. The judge didn't remember any of it. Went to the new hearing. And again, I think I've talked about this, guys. The judge does not remember you. Watch the video. When you're going into a new motion or a new hearing or a new trial, the law will control the outcome. Not your judge's memories. That's one of the worst disadvantages that non-attorneys have. They just think that here's the sort of vibe that I got from the last hearing and this new hearing, the judge is going to pick up where we left off. They could be completely different at your next hearing. Completely different. The only certainty that you have is that in some sense, the law will control. So learning about all of these different things is important. Um, I was going to talk about stipulations next. A lot of times... <laughs> Uh, in these cases, child custody conflict uh, cases, one side will say, we don't want to go to court, so let's just like type everything up and then sign it. They'll even think, let's get a notary <laughs> to sign it, to think that that somehow makes it more powerful. Uh, at best, that's a contract, at best. Um, it's not an order, and it's only enforceable in the way that a contract would be enforceable. When you think about kids, kids are people. Kids are human beings. They're not slaves. And the court is only bound by the contract in the ways that the law allows it. Um, there are some provisions in law where a parent's preference is taken into consideration, for example. So say somebody does a notarized letter or even just an unnotarized letter saying that they want this other person to have guardianship of their kids while they're in another country or, or in jail or something like that. Um, I've seen cases where the judge will take the letter and they'll say, okay, I'm going to enter temporary guardianship. 
uh, because not because the letter says so, not because the letter controls the judge, but because there is a statutory provision that says that one of the things that the court should consider is the preferences of the parent. But that's just a consideration. And that's only because the law says so. In that particular case, it went to an evidentiary hearing, and I guess the grandparents ended up winning. The court said, okay, here we are. It's an evidentiary hearing. I gave temporary custody to this other person because it seemed like that's what the mom wanted. That's what the law said I had to consider. Well, here we are at a hearing. Uh, the law still says I have to consider that letter. And I'm considering the letter, but I'm also considering all of these other best interest factors. And based on the best interest of the child, having considered these other factors, including the letter, I'm going to rule that guardianship is going to go to this other person. You have to understand that your kids are not slaves. They are not property. And the, the, your wishes and your preferences are only going to control in the ways that the law allows them to control. Um, so when these people do these letters and stuff, I understand that they're trying to just avoid the court system. I get that the court system is scary, but oftentimes it can be used against you. You can be blindsided. A person can um, also use a letter. Another way um, is uh, relocation because the law says that that's something that's taken into consideration. The relocation laws say that you can relocate if the other person gives you written permission. So that's written into law. Um, so, so I'm just trying to give people the understanding that these letters that people are trying to draft, they they can be used in some sort of sense, especially when it doesn't come to your kids. So like if it comes to the distribution of assets and debts, money, maybe even child support, though I have some doubts about that. Um, there are some ways in which you can contract that out. But what I'm about to get to is what you really want to do is a stipulation. If you already have a custody case open, there is this wonderful mechanism called a stipulation. And it's it's filed into the court just like any other agreement that you're going to do. You type it out. You mention what you're going to agree to. The only difference is the judge will sign it. And that will, it's what they call merge. It will merge your written agreement into an order of the court. And now it's enforceable under contempt of court. Um, you can have your ex jailed or fined if they violate it. It's way, way better to do this. In fact, if you have an ex who says, I want to avoid the court system, let's just work this out, you know, between ourselves. And you say, hold on a second, a stipulation does avoid the court system. A lot of times they don't even set a hearing, guys. A lot of times people cite a, a file a stipulation and the judge will just sign it. So there is no stress of getting attorneys going to court, standing there in front of a judge. Um, if your ex is saying, no, 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 I don't want to do that. I want to do this letter. I don't want to do the stipulation. That that's a red flag to you that they're going to pull some kind of stunt because stipulations are just as low stress as letters are. They are, in fact, in many ways, less stressful than letters are because then you know it's going to get signed by the judge and it's going to become enforceable. So definitely, if you have an ex that's trying to avoid the court system, and they want to do a letter, but they don't want to file a stipulation with the court and get it signed, something fishy is going on there because you don't have to hire an attorney to do a stipulation. You don't have to stand in a courtroom. It's not stressful at all. I, I've done a bunch of stipulations in my child custody case. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, watch my docket series and you will see the stipulations that I entered to and they are very low key, low stress. They're signed by the judge. Magically, they become enforceable. It's the best thing ever. So there's no reason why you should have an ex that is, in fact, I don't even think they, I think they're free. I don't even think you have to pay for them. Um, if you haven't opened a case yet, it's a little tiny bit trickier. And I say tiny because there is a filing fee, which you can get out of with the fee waiver. So seriously, it's not that much trickier. A, a tiny bit more work, big whoop. Um, it's called a joint petition. The only difference between a joint petition and a stipulation is that a joint petition is a pleading. It's a magic word in Nevada. It's, <laughs> it's one of the documents that opens up the case um, and sets forth the jurisdictional boundaries of the case. If you want to learn more about this, watch my video, The Complaint. I'm not going to talk about the technicalities right now. I will just say that if you don't have a court case open, you won't be able to file a stipulation because you don't have a stipulation Sorry, you don't have a case to file the stipulation into, but you can do the same exact thing. It's just a different document. 
It's called a joint petition. You file it and that will open up your case and you should get an order very quickly, which will close your case. Also very low stress. If you do have kids involved, sometimes the judge will want to have one hearing just to hash things out with you, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. It's not a huge deal. It's not like anybody's opposing anybody else. It's not like there's a conflict between both sides. Sometimes the judge will say, there's kids involved. I just want to talk to you guys about certain things. I'm looking at your child support. Things are a little fishy here. I want to talk about your incomes. I just want to make sure everything is on the up and up. Um, but again, it should be very low stress because it's not adversarial. So the joint petition, just like the stipulation, uh, should be very straightforward. And at the end of the day, you should be getting a decree or a judgment consistent with what you agreed to that is enforceable by the court. So same thing, very technical difference. Um, and, I, and I did mention that since you didn't have a case open, you will have to pay a filing fee. But if you guys can't afford the filing fee, just get it waived. Just get it waived. If you want to learn more about that, watch my video on the topic, Form a Papyrus. Next, I wanted to talk about the limitations on stipulations. They are rare, but they're, they are out there. As a rule of thumb, if something sounds really, really, really fishy or too good to be true, you should do your research on it because it might be too good to be true. Uh, I can give you two examples. Uh, the Supreme Court calls, uh, there are certain laws that will just plain not let you negotiate your rights. Um, I think the Supreme Court has referred to this as super legal reach. For example, the child support modification statutes have super legal reach. There are cases that describe this. I'm not going to mention the cases because that could change. New cases could come out. Things could change. Make sure you do your research. But uh, for example, there was uh, a case where a person uh, settled on child support, which is okay. You could do that. But then he also settled that he would not have the right to change his child support. That was something that the Supreme Court had an issue with. They said that you can settle on child support, but you always have the right to come back and try to modify it if the circumstances have changed. And this particular individual settled on an amount because he was a stockbroker. And then the stock market collapsed. He lost most of his income and he tried to modify child support. And his ex said, no, 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 no. You cut a deal that said you can't modify so you're going to have to keep paying this insane amount of child support. And the Supreme Court of Nevada said, I understand that he, he agreed to this. I understand that it's a stipulation that the court approved. It's become an order of the court. But these particular laws flat out do not allow you to negotiate this away. And for that reason, they invalidated the stipulation. Another example is a veteran's disability. I guess there is some kind of federal laws. Um, Congress made it clear that veterans cannot be negotiated out of their uh, disability. And even in the case where stipulations and orders were entered and they agreed to it, and even in, in the sense that they tried to like create other mechanisms in place to deal with the problem, I guess indemnification was one of them. These are things that I only have um, a little bit of knowledge on. Because there are uh, federal laws and because Congress made its intent clear, abundantly clear, that this was not something that could be negotiated away, the Supreme Court of Nevada said the same thing, which is, okay, yeah, he agreed to it. It's a stipulation. It's or it's an order. The judge signed it. They approved it. We understand all this. We don't care. It's void. So, yes, there are, there are limits to what you can stipulate away, and you should probably think about doing some research if it sounds too good to be true. Um, so there may be other areas where this is a thing. I just wanted to talk about this. Is this, is, this is something that you should think about if you're trying to get a deal on something that just sounds way out there. So, uh, sabotaging your own settlement. This is a sort of counterintuitive thing that I wanted to talk about where you might think to yourself, yeah, I want to settle my case. And one of the things that I can do is show good faith by giving my ex or your, your opponent extensions. Maybe there's motions coming up. Maybe there's a trial coming up and you really want to settle it. So you're like, okay, yeah, let's do this in two months, three months, four months. We'll, we'll push it back. You could end up actually sabotaging 
your, your desire to get a settlement because the other side might not really care about settling. They might just be trying to buy time. There were multiple examples of this. I guess the most egregious example that I can think of, there's a friend of mine who won an appeal and he got an order reversing and his ex was afraid of what would happen on reversal. And so she kept saying, um, let's meet, let's have a coffee, let's go to lunch, let's go to dinner. Um, and, and she kept getting extensions, three months, six months, nine months, a year. Eventually, like two years later, finally, this father was like, that's it. I am done giving you extensions. It's been two years. And uh, he, uh, he, he got a hearing on that reversal in the... <laughs> The ex and her attorney actually had the unmitigated gall to tell the court that he should lose his right to getting any kind of relief on appeal because he let it delay for two years. So even though she was the one that was asking for the delays, she ended up weaponizing that and telling the judge, since he sat on his hands for two years, you should just ignore this court of appeals order and just, just say, your fault, you took too long. Of course, the guy felt horribly, horribly backstabbed because all he was trying to do was was give her what she wanted and work things out. He didn't expect that she was going to uh, stick a knife in his back the second that it went to a hearing. Luckily, <laughs> the judge was like, no, this is not going to fly. Um, he was he was giving you extensions um, to be nice, and we're going to go to a hearing on what we should do on the Court of Appeals order reversing. Um, and of course, as soon as she saw that that hearing was coming... And that he wasn't going to budge, he ended up getting everything he wanted. But that's just a great example that I like to give people, is sometimes um, by being nice and by telling the other side, hey, I want to settle, um, and giving them extensions, you could actually be sabotaging your own desire to get a settlement. So be careful about that. I talk about this more in the video um, delay tactics. So if you want to learn more about this, watch that video. Uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about is offers of judgment. I don't think Every single state has this mechanism. Nevada does. Um, offers of judgment are a very special type of mechanism that is in place to put teeth behind your offer to settle your case. And typically, those teeth involve attorney fee awards and cost awards. Um, I'm not going to talk about this in detail because it is highly, highly technical. Highly, highly technical. Uh, but it is a powerful mechanism that you should do research on. They definitely apply to money lawsuits. And I've seen that in a limited sense, they seem to apply to property division and uh, debt division um, in divorce actions. They don't seem to apply at all to anything involving kids. Um, but typically, the gist of it is that you draft an offer of judgment, that you send it to your opponent, and that they have a certain amount of time to accept it or reject it. If they accept it, it becomes a judgment. So the case is over. Wonderful. If they reject it, then my understanding is that it sets a bar that they now have to exceed when they go to trial. Uh, typically, if you are a plaintiff, if you win a dollar, you've won your case. And you will become a prevailing party and you will get money consistent with you having become a prevailing party, even if you want a dollar or five dollars or ten dollars. As long as you win something, you are the winner. With an offer of judgment, my understanding is that it raises that bar up to the amount of the offer. So like say the offer was $25,000. Well now, if you win a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, it's not enough. You are going to get hit with attorney fees and costs. So it's a wonderful mechanism, I think, because it really forces the other side to stop and think, hold on a second. If we go to trial, we can't just win a couple of bucks now. We have to win at least this amount. And there may be other provisions. There may be a certain percentage over the amount, something like that. So definitely research offers of judgment because my understanding is they, they apply in certain cases that they have to be drafted very specifically or they can be invalidated. They can't just be drafted in any way, shape, or form. And um, there are other ways to get out of them. So there's a ton of case law on offers of judgment. There are statutes on it. There are court rules on it. Learn about it because it does matter. Um, and both sides should know how they work. 
and hopefully leverage them because it sounds to me like that's a great mechanism to get cases to settle that might not otherwise settle. Um, with all that being said, this is the new video on mediation and settlement. If you have any questions, feel free to place them down in the comments below and I will see you guys next time.